thanks to Dean Tony Cascardi for um, initiating uh, tonight's uh, esteemed lecture coming to campus. He's been here all week. Uh, Brewster Kale. My name is Abigail Tukosnik, and I'm an associate professor here on this campus in both the Berkeley Center for New Media and the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. Brewster Kale is my hero. And whether you know it or not, he is your hero too. I'll give a brief biographical sketch of Mr. Kale before explaining his heroics. Soon after graduating from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Mr. Kale began his career as an entrepreneur. He got into the business of making supercomputers when he, found, when he helped found the company Thinking Machines. Then in 1989, Mr. Kale started networked publishing, building the first internet publishing system called Wide Area Information Server. Waits in 1989, uh, I said 1989, which he eventually sold to AOL. In 1996, Mr. Kale co-founded Alexa Internet, which helps catalog the web, uh, later selling it to Amazon.com in 1999. And in 1996, he founded the Internet Archive, which now preserves 25 petabytes of data. Is that still, is that still the number? Yep. All right, great. <laughs> uh, consisting of digitized or born digital books, web pages, music and sound, films and television and software. The Internet Archive is one of the largest libraries in the world. And now I'll say more about Mr. Kale's heroism. Here are some sections from my book, Rogue Archives, which will be published by MIT Press this summer. Uh, so this is, this is me quoting me now. <laughs> However widely the myth of the automatically archival internet has spread over the past few decades, the fact is that the system of networked computing utterly fails as a memory machine. Professionals in the library and information sciences have issued warnings about digital data's tendency to degrade and disappear since the mid-1990s. They have collectively proclaimed that the internet and computers do not constitute the greatest archive in human history, but quite the reverse. The current historical moment, they argue, may be a digital dark age, a time of which future generations will have scant records owing to the short lifespans of our current digital platforms, devices, and applications as compared to the lifespans of older technologies such as paper. In the late 1990s, voices outside of the library and information sciences for example, from the mainstream press, the business world, and humanities research, joined in the chorus cautioning that digital technologies are often anti-archival. For example, in 1999, Stuart Brand, an early new media entrepreneur who founded the influential Whole Earth magazine, published an essay in library journal called Escaping the Digital Dark Age. Brand called for, quote, a long-term strategy for storage, end quote, a remedy to the fact that, quote, there is still nothing in the digital world like acid-free paper, end quote. Brand quoted an admonition from Peter Lyman, a librarian at the University of California, Berkeley. So this is a quote from Peter Lyman. We know there is a 500-year life to microfilm properly cared for, but what do we do with digital documents? We need a digital equivalent to microfilm, a 500-year solution. In 1997, Brewster Kale published an essay in Scientific American called Archiving the Internet, in which he announced that he had created a new organization, the Internet Archive, a year prior. Kale writes within the Digital Dark Age discourse. So now I'm quoting Mr. Kale. <laughs> While the Internet's World Wide Web is unprecedented in spreading the popular voice of millions that would never have been published before, no one has recorded these documents and images from one year ago. The history of early materials in each medium is one of loss and eventual partial reconstruction through fragments. A group of entrepreneurs and engineers have determined to not let this happen to the early internet. And Mr. Keel is my hero because he is determined to not let our splendiferous age of communication, production, and circulation, which we call the early digital age, become a dark age in the history of the world. He is keeping the lamps lit on our era for hopefully all the eras to come. If you care about the preservation of knowledge and creativity, the safeguarding of arts and culture in every genre and every format for future generations, a free and open internet and a free and open society, then Mr. Kale is your hero too. Please join me in welcoming Brewster Kale.
those together, uh, as well as Craig um, uh, can bring him over. It's been a fabulous week so far. And am I on enough to, to be heard? Great. Um, well, I thought I'd start this talk um, with a web page. Um, this is a press release um, by uh, from the White House of uh, when the president was on the um, deck of an aircraft carrier, and the um, proudly proclaimed the president uh, Bush announces that combat operations in Iraq have ended. Um, Um, then, about five months later, they changed the press release. Mm -hmm. uh, the press release uh, read, President uh, Bush announced that major combat operations had, they, they just reached back in time and changed the press release that had been put out uh, several uh, months before. And it, so that sort of brings that kind of Orwellian kind of uh, uh, flag going up of going and reaching back in history. But then, a couple years later, uh, just from from that, while the Bush administration was still there, the press release just disappeared off the web completely. So there's just no official record of it. You search, you, you couldn't find this particular um, uh, uh, web page. There's something very unsettling, I'd say, about this, but it's all very natural that actually things are, are changed and deleted off the web all the time. So what I'd like to do to talk tonight is about the right to remember. The idea of coming around to what does memory mean in our digital age? How are we supposed to relate to it? What are we as people and as memory uh, organ organisms, ourselves, our institutions, what role do we play uh, in this unfolding uh, digital age? To do this, I'm going to go back uh, a bit and, and, and draw a, a long line, though, to try to get back to this right to remember and how we've been able to build actually a real new opportunity, not to just look back on and say, wouldn't it be terrible if, but what we can actually use this for. And I'm going to actually use myself in this, uh, uh, as a thread for this. Um, that's me and uh, the fuzzy hair uh, next to uh, a, a supercomputer uh, that we were building in the early 1980s, the connection machine. Um, so this. Uh, for me, this story okay. starts back in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, walking across the Harvard Bridge, going back and forth to, to uh, MIT. Uh, and a, a friend of mine had asked um, me, he said, you're an idealist, yes, and, and a technologist, yes. Paint me a positive portrait with that, uh, what you can do with your technology. And I thought about that, and it actually was a harder question to answer. And I, I urge you to do the same sort of thing yourself, which is sort of, what can you actually do that's positive? It's easy to complain. Um, and there was only two things I could really come up with out of, that were in the air at the moment. One was using encryption to protect people's privacy, and the other was to try to build a library of everything. Could we build a library of Alexandria version 2? And the answer, we, we knew that the, you know, this sort of li the Library of Congress on everybody's desk was kind of promised, even by then, in 1980. Um, and it just hadn't materialized. And, Okay, that, that couldn't be that hard. It turned out the privacy one was actually very hard uh, to do. So I, I went on to plan B, which was to build a library of everything. And so we, we had some steps to go. One is the computers were really dorky and, and, and kind of not very useful. So we, uh, there was this idea, Danny Hillis had an idea of building a supercomputer. Uh, this computer had 32 megabytes. <laughs> that was a big deal. Uh, so 32 megabytes, we could do a lot with that. Um, in terms of going and putting text in it and trying to find patterns within it. And we were able to do a search engine back then that was able to go and move through 400 newspapers and magazines. And that, I thought the sun was going to come up a new color, right? <laughs> Suddenly, people were going to see and, and understand the world in a new and different way, and peace was going to break out around the world, and it didn't happen. Um, so we so went back and said, okay, why not? And said, well, because people really couldn't get access to these things were very expensive. It cost a dollar a minute on Dow Jones, which is who we sold the system to to go and run this thing. Um, and so we said, okay, what if we did it such that it was going to be on this new thing called the ARPANET and the internet? And uh, so we said, okay, that's a good application. 
why don't we go and, and, and do that? And so I, I got to work with these interesting people to try to figure out, is it possible to go and build it all online? And we, we knew there was Moore's Law and the falling prices. And so I had these, the opportunity to work with some fun people. This is me dropping here. This is Richard Feynman. Uh, looking very intent, uh, as if I had something awesome to tell them. So, uh, so there's, uh, and we basically calculated out um, how much it would take to store the Library of Congresses and the books, and then when could we do all music, and we just charted it out, and we've actually been on that graph. And so we built a system to try to build this uh, towards this vision. It's called Waze. Um, and got this really nice write-up in the New York Times on the idea of having PC users having access to vast libraries over this new thing that was going to happen, which was the internet. This is from 1991, and it was, for me, a stepping stone. We needed computers, and we needed people using, we needed publishers to come online um, to make all of this happen. There's a fellow, um, Raj Reddy, from Carnegie Mellon, that, uh, had this, uh, I think, just amazingly great phrase, um, universal access to human knowledge. And that was one of his real passions that he wanted. He was the dean of computer science there. This is possible, and I like that phrase so much, I just swiped it. And so it made it the, uh, basically the motto of the uh, not, not existing, uh, well, around that time existing internet archive um, that we were trying to build universal access to all knowledge. So by 1996, there was enough publishing going on online, and the, the, it was done in an open enough way, which a lot of us threw ourselves at, rather than sort of the closed world of AOL or, or what Microsoft was building at the time, Loudquirk. Uh, we wanted this open internet thing so that you could build new things on top of it, and from my perspective, wanted to build a library. And so we built this uh, thing called the Internet Archive, which is a nonprofit library. It's an independent library. And there aren't very many independent libraries anymore. Andrew Carnegie basically socialized the library system. He basically took it and made it part of the, um, the government, which I think is very interesting, because that's a really hardcore capitalist. I like to look at what people carve in stone, um, because it's things that they really want you to pay attention to over time. So I look at things that are over doors of libraries. And I, uh, one in the Boston Public Library, built by, I think, well, more of the robber barons, um, was free to all. Right? It was not a, a group that was known for sharing much. Um, but the idea of information is, has a different sense to it. it. It's got to be dealt with in a different way. So this idea of coming, by coming up through the technology ranks, really the idea of the libraries and what libraries do for people seem like the right um, match. And so the first step for me uh, was to try and archive the World Wide Web. We spent a lot of time building this thing to be an open publishing platform. Now it's time to make it permanent and make it more useful. Um, so we started building this thing. We started crawling the web. And we had these robots that would basically go and click on every link on every page. It's just like the stupidest robot you can imagine. And it would just basically see a page and record it. And then it would find the links on it and click on those and just follow the World Wide Web around. Um, and that's as, um, and it was a fairly stupid and simple uh, process to be able to go uh, and, and build this uh, system. And it wasn't actually all that hard. It just had, we had to overcome a couple of barriers. People had two complaints. One, it was impossible. And the other was, it was stupid to do it if you could. So, you know, not possible because, you know, it's all fleeting and, you know, and, uh, and then there's, you know, it's all trash out there anyway. What, who could possibly care? Um, and so we did it anyway. Um, and it, uh, it turned out to be popular. Um, so this is what Yahoo looked like in 1996. It's a very clean website, kind of like Google today. Uh, we'll see what happens to Google in a few years. Um, but it's, it's sort of a, a, a clean idea. Uh, Pets.com, you know, the sock puppet. I, I love the dreamers. I, I, I like the people, even if they get it really wrong. You know, the idea of getting pet food through the mail. I guess it's coming back around, isn't it? But anyway, um, but, uh, it's sort of, it's sort of bad ideas. Uh, I looked at, uh, what did UC Berkeley's website look like in 1996? Okay, 
Right? Um, you know, uh, but very, very simple. But, it, but this, you know, it, Berkeley, it, it doesn't have to go and, and, and think itself terribly, uh, because this is what MIT is. <laughs> so, I, I don't think you have to uh, uh, particularly worry. Um, so so we, we crawl all of this, and um, my lawyer friends uh, said, you're going to get in trouble. Um, you're, you're crawling and you're capturing everybody else's stuff. Um, this is, and you're not asking permission. We tried asking permission, and <laughs> um, that didn't work very well. We sent out these emails to the webmasters, like, can we do this? And they, the people would write back and say, you're, you're spamming us. Right? And uh, it's like, okay, we'll, we'll stop asking. So we, uh, so we just started ca uh, capturing it unless people said not to. And that was sort of the, the we, we wanted to do this early enough um, so this is around the time of Alta Vista, even before Google, um, to basically get it so that it was part of how the internet worked. We just wanted to get that out there early when we started collecting. But then we wanted to go and turn around and make it available again. So we made a thing called the Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine is named after uh, uh, the uh, Rocky Bullwinkle show, um, Sherman and Peabody, you know, turn the Wayback Machine and see the, uh, what the web looked like at different times. C. Smith came up with this name and he said, we should, first you should build this Wayback Machine. And it's like, okay. So we did. Um, and uh, but all of our, our, our lawyers' friends said, he said, bad things are going to happen to you. Lawyers are going to rain on you like frogs. <laughs> right? You, the, you know, the idea of going and making this you now public again, everybody else's web pages, verbatim, is going to be trouble. So Berkeley did something really amazing. At, in the Bancroft uh, Library, um, they basically hosted a launch of the Wayback Machine. And it was launched with uh, Larry Lester speaking, the head of the J School, head of uh, Bancroft Library. And they knew what they were doing. They were taking this upstart project, which um, lived in a land of some uncertainty, and they were putting their umbrella over it and saying, well, you're one of us. And that was, um, and I suggest it's because of the launch there, and Larry Lessig knew a uh, great guy down in, uh, uh, in, <clears throat> at the LA Times, and they wrote it up from a very positive angle. And that that's why the, the whole project has continued to exist. It's basically, we did our respectful thing, and it was sort of accepted, even though if you read every uh, law treatise, you'd probably find all sorts of risks that we were doing, but it, but it worked. And it's moved on, even. So there's not just a dumb robot running around. There's a system of librarians that are going and working together to build uh, subject collections um, around uh, the web archives. So it's not just a bot that runs around. It's people running around. So there's uh, now there's 1,700 curated collections that are searchable and browsable from over 300 organizations. And an example of this is when the Japanese disaster happened in 2011. The people from all over the world said, I want to help make sure that this uh, disaster is recorded. This project just kind of like the World Wide Web. And it's worked very well. Another example, there's a button now on a site that allows you to save a web page right now. If there's a web page that you think should be archived right now. And this um, is hit about 50 times a second now. And we think some of those are robots. Um, <laughs> but but at least there, there are some humans there. Um, and there was a, um, a, a blog post by a Ukrainian separatist <clears throat> that was very proud of shooting down an airliner that was going across um, uh, the Ukraine that he was sure was a military cargo plane. And went and bragged about it. And it turned out that it was actually a commercial jet that was full of Dutch people. And it got shot down, and somebody, while this blog post was up, which wasn't up for very long, somebody hit save page now. Um, and um, that was able to then be used as the sort of um, how do you go and disavow somebody bragging about something um, if it's saved actually in archive. That's fairly difficult to. Disavow, if you will. So the web collection is, is going along well. And so we thought, okay, what else can, uh, can we do with this idea that the web doesn't have everything on it? In fact, uh, we wanted to shift not just be, to be an archive 
uh, of the internet, how about being an archive on the internet? Can we go and take all the rest of stuff um, and put it within reach of our kids? What's actually it's a little depressing. Um, we said, oh, you're going to turn to your computers to answer questions. At first they go, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. No, that's not going to happen. And then they said, okay. And then people shifted and said, I can answer all questions through this screen. But you can't, actually. It's a lot is missing uh, from what's out there. So when we started to look at things like texts, like books, journal literature, um, I'd say the father of, of digital libraries is Michael Lesk, um, who's been in this field forever. He's he, one of those depressing gentlemen that I know. Whenever I've gone and thought I've, I've come up with something new or novel or interesting, it turns out he's written the key papers on it 10 years before. Uh, and, and he, he, uh, he's one of those, um, those people. And he, he said, I'm worried about the 20th century. The 19th century is actually taking it care of itself pretty well. We're digitizing it along. We're putting it all online. It's all working fairly well. Um, the 21st century, he thought it was going to take care of itself, um, just because it's, it's naturally. But he's worried about the 20th century. And it's played out um, to actually be right. There's this uh, article in, um, in The Atlantic. And these are what books you can actually buy in, in Amazon. Um, it ramps up to 1923, which is the sort of the uh, end of the open period of, <laughs> of, of publishing. Where, uh, everything before that is out of copyright uh, in the United States. And then it takes this major dive for the uh, decades through the 20th century, and it pops back up again in the 21st century. So he's absolutely right. There's this hole. It's also been a real problem in our collections. So this is a little harder to make out, but this is the Open Library website, and of course all the books that we've digitized uh, and made, made available, and the publishing dates. And the publishing dates are, are going along well, because lots of libraries help participate in digitizing materials for the open world, including the University of California, uh, with a massive project at NRLF and, and SRLF to digitize these materials before um, uh, UC went with Berkeley. Uh, with with, uh, with um, uh, Google, um, they were doing things in the open, um, and these materials were uh, uh, made available uh, broadly. But they would, they were nervous about going beyond 1923 because of the copyright issues. And so there's a lot of materials that are available uh, openly on the Internet Archive site that are really modern and really old. But we're missing the 20th century, and the 20th century was a pretty impactful century. I mean, a lot of things, good things, bad things happen. And the idea of forgetting the 20th century is probably not a good idea. Um, so I'd say this is a bit of a call to action, that we have the room and responsibility to fill this in. That it's, our, it's now time to do it, to go and bring this thing forward. I would say we have a, not only a right to remember, we have a responsibility to remember, that we should use our institutions and move it forward and be able to build out the complete collections to the generation that is turning to their screens um, for, uh, for information. So how do we do this? Well, how hard is it? So the Library of Congress is the largest library by far. It's 28 million volumes. You end up with um, uh, a book is about a megabyte. If you had the words in it, it's about, about a megabyte. 28 million megabytes of mega, giga, tera. So 28 terabytes. 28 terabytes fits on four hard drives that cost less than a month's rent. So you can store all of the words in the Library of Congress in a single shopping cart in Best Buy and not blow out your credit card uh, uh, limit. That's pretty amazing. So the idea of going and getting this stuff and, and being able to deal with it is, is within our grasp. We, if you're doing images of pages, then it's a bit more. But then you can not only uh, use these things on screen, but we found that there are people that wanted them printed back out again. So we made this book mobile. It's kind of fun. Uh, it's a band with a satellite dish and a printer binder cutter. And you can download, print, and bind your own book. And a hundred page, uh, a short book like Alice in Wonderland costs about a buck a book to download, print, and buy. So, and that's actually less than it costs to lend a book from a library in terms of the administrative costs. 
So the idea that you can go and have these materials out to a much broader set of people is also quite possible. So that universal access, we did a couple of them in India. We did one in Alexandria, Egypt. And this is a, a, a project we did in Uganda. So not only um, can we have these wonderful collections, I just visited the, uh, the Northern Regional Library Facility when, they, when I was asked to give this lecture. They said, is there anything else you'd like to do in, at Berkeley? I said, yes, I'd like to go and see the insides of your, your temple of books. And it's, uh, it's, it's in the Richmond, uh, in the town of Richmond, and I highly recommend you try to also break in and get to see this. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it's sort of like walking inside a computer server. Uh, in the sense that all of the books are organized by size. It, it, it's a really surreal uh, kind of place. It's 8 million um, books, but it's completely wonderful. But mostly people are reading things on screens, and there are all sorts of different transcriptions of the same book that can be come out, including the one on the bottom uh, uh, left there, uh, bottom right, which is a talking machine that reads books to the to blind and dyslexic. It talks a little bit like this. But it works. Um, the idea that you can now take the books that are in Richmond, it's 8 million books, and be able to make them available to anybody around the world is quite doable. We built these uh, book scanners, and there are these scanning systems all over the world um, now, um, where we're been digitizing about 1,000 books every day. This is an interesting book from my perspective. It came from the Bancroft. And it is a very, very old Korean book, even though I understand the, the characters are Chinese, but it's an old Korean book um, from the Star Collection, which is owned by the Bancroft. And it's being digitized and paid for by the Koreans. So the Koreans pay to digitize it as a way of repatriating. So it's repatriation through digitization, which I think is a wonderful motivation for getting things back uh, to where they could be. This is a uh, 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 books out of the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. But we wanted to do complete collections. So I went around and I've been trying to find some a, a people that have a complete literature that we could go and put online. So the Greeks, so the uh, Icelandic. And the first that said yes was were the Balinese. So uh, the Balinese have three million people that speak Balinese. And um, so we said, let's could we do this with all of your literature? They said yes. I said, what is your literature? How does it work? Said, it's on palm leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, uh, the, they, they break out on, on palm leaves. Um, and so we did these high res photographs of all of the writings in Bali. I have the best job ever. <laughs> uh, and, and so this is a project with the Balinese uh, government to go and make all of this uh, available. We said, how can we read these? How can people get experience of these materials? And they said, Oh, well, many of them are shadow puppet plays. Um, uh, you know, it's like readings of books being shadow puppet plays. Or, 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 or there, and so we started to get the videos of the readings of these works, or dances and the like. So I, I think it's very interesting that the first complete literature of a people to go online is the Balinese. So let's give a hand to the Balinese. <laughs> I think we should just go through, if we can, whole either fields or universities or languages and start to find what would it mean to go and, and open up. So these scanning centers have been uh, put up and out there, and there are now millions of texts uh, available, even in copyright ones, through a lending system. This is another product of how do you deal with the copyright issues? How do you make it so that people don't yell at you so much that you uh, have to stop. Um, so we uh, started digitizing modern books and made a site called the Open Library. And we made it so you could borrow books, which is sort of sounds really dorky and odd to go and borrow some, a digital book, which you should be able to just have it. But we thought if we did that, people would yell at us. Um, so we would buy some books uh, that might be checked out. And checked out means that you have to then add it to your wait list and, and uh, that it would email you and say you can now take it out. Um, but publishers weren't selling as many books so um, uh, that we could lend in this way. So we just digitize and lend. And this is actually a book from um, the Boston Public Library. 
um, on Mayflower Descendants. I guess that's why it's not checked out. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so there, there are many libraries that have been digitizing their in copyright, non rights cleared materials and then lending them uh, out to so one reader at a time. It's a start. Um, what we really like to do is bring all libraries digital so that all libraries that have physical books, we, they would just get a digital version of them and then they could use them however they think that they can and should within themselves, say for researcher use or maybe on campus use. And we've been doing this now for five years and it's been working out as a model quite well. Uh, one of the other major projects, which is uh, Google Books with Hathi Trust, was stopped by the courts um, because it sort of made it much too monopolistic um, a, a system. So if we end up with a distributed library system at the end of the day, that seems like a, a good idea. So web pages and books, we can see our way through uh, going to Raj Reddy's vision of universal access. Can we do it to all the other media types? So I've got a few more uh, media types um, of sort of how are we doing out there? So we're saying, let's just kind of get there. How do we go and make it so that it's all up? So music is another set of lawyers that, uh, is, uh, that uh, has another set of lawyers that you don't want to really tangle with. Um, and so how do you go and step into that world in such a way that you can bring access to things but not get uh, in, into trouble for it? Um, and actually try to help um, uh, what's going on out there. So we started with actually concert recordings. It's a tradition that the Grateful Dead started of recording concerts and, and trading tapes. Um, and it turns out lots of other bands copied this idea. And we have 6,000 uh, bands that said yes. They, somebody in the band, it wasn't uh, somebody signing a trip, it might have been the drummer. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, okay, sure. And, uh, and, and then if, if they wanted to take it down, we'd, we'd take it down. But it turns out that people don't want to take it down. And we have everything they're grateful that it's ever done. And it's actually one of the most popular things the Internet Archive has done, is going to put the Grateful Dead online for the deadheads. And it's been an interesting role for me where I thought we were going to go and digitize things and make things available. But what has come about is we've become a live host for people. We've become part of the infrastructure. For people that want to share, we can basically use our servers as a resource. In the United States, it's, it shouldn't cost you to give something away. And usually, if you give something to charity or, or, or the world, you get a pat on the back and a tax deduction. Except online, where you can go broke by going and paying all the bandwidth fees. So how do you deal with this? Well, you might go and put it on YouTube or, or some other uh, service. And uh, the Internet Archive is playing a role kind of like that, but with a different perspective because of the nonprofit um, aspect of how we operate. And that's been helping it, uh, people give things away. We've brought things, music back that were on websites, important early websites that people trusted with their recordings um, uh, to go and share them, and then the company went away. And this happens all the time. Did you know there used to be Google Video for YouTube? Yeah. And about five or six million videos that people uploaded, and they just turned it off. Yeah. Um, so the only copy of those, I think, are, are in us. And yep, there was Yahoo Video, not anymore. Uh, so even these large successful companies don't keep uh, the materials up once it's not commercially available, uh, uh, required. There's other communities, net labels, and we're starting to move into LPs uh, and CDs um, to go and make these things available. For universities, I, 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 you know, librarians live for, for people saying, we need your stuff. Um, so this is Daniel Ellis from Columbia University saying that in his research of going and trying to understand all music, he needs access to large music collections, and he can't get a hold of them. And in fact, actually, it's a little sad. He's left Columbia, and he's working at Google. I hope he goes back to Columbia, because we librarians can go and make it so that you can do your work without having to go to these central places um, to be able to get access to the materials that are required for your work. So we've now done these listening areas um, that are on campus. So on campus use seems to work around all very well. So even going and digitizing audio and hosting millions of items of audio is working. So 
the idea of bringing universal access to all knowledge is moving forward. A couple more media types. So, um, moving images, most people think of it as Hollywood films. We really haven't gone very far into that. But there are lots of other films that people seem to love. These are educational films, industrial films, uh, government films. And we've digi been digitizing these and putting them up. And people love them. We're not quite sure why. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe it's a view of the 20th century that's not filtered in quite the same way. Um, so these older materials and then hosting materials since before YouTube offered to do it. Using sort of digitization uh, techniques and some boldness. So this is um, by, uh, VHS collections. Um, and basically we've been going through and finding, volunteers have been finding which ones are not available for sale as DVDs. And if they're not available for sale as DVD, they digitize the VHS tape and put it up. And that threshold has worked fine. So you stay out of the way of commerce, but we can move forward. So we didn't go and ask uh, all of the lawyers we could. Um, we basically tried to find something that we thought would work. And it's all around worked. Another collection that we started building in the year 2000 is television. Um, so television is a very persuasive and pervasive medium. Um, so we started recording Russian, Chinese, Japanese, Iraqi, Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN, ABC, Fox, 24 hours a day DVD enormous collection. Um, but we've only made some of it available. First we uh, made some available, the 9-11. Um, and here's where a library was trying to become relevant to its time. So, uh, so September 11, 2001, major event. On October 11, 2001, we put up the video from around the world of what did people see for the week, September 11 to September 18. So we just dumped it all online. And everybody was on good behavior, they didn't yell at us. In fact, it all worked as people were trying to understand each other. And it was fundamentally a television event. So it's still up on the net. But we've gone further than that. Roger McDonald and the group uh, was working at the Internet Archive to lend television. So that you can go and search and find, based on transcripts, um, and anything from US television news and find sh short clips. We want everyone to be a John Stewart research department. And you make it so that anybody can go and go and say, well, he said this, and now they said this. Right? That sort of compare and contrast, or quoting, that is required for critical thinking, but difficult to do with a medium that streams over like television. So we think libraries should have these materials and make them available again. And um, it's been working. We've been doing this now for a couple of years, and people are actually in the broadcasters are happy because they have more access than they used to have to their uh, old archives. So you can go and search on things, find where they are in the timelines, uh, and be able to, to see clips. If you want the whole thing, we print it onto a DVD and lend it to you. And this again, this sort of lending being clunky is part of our survival strategy to go and make it so that we can continue to do this and not interrupt commerce. Um, there's a project that um, the Internet Archive is leading to take all of the political ads that are running in 20 markets in the United States. So we're recording all the television, four channels of television in each of 20 markets, all of it, and then finding all of the political ads and making a web page for every political ad and tying it to where is it playing, how often is it playing, and tying it to who's funding it uh, and who's funding the fight people that are hiding behind the funding. And, uh, and also, uh, what did uh, uh, fact checkers think? This is an example of where we think libraries should go, where we're, we're not just sitting back and looking at things historically. We're trying to inject new ideas into the current discussion based on being able to see a bigger view. My friend Jesse Osabel put it, we got really far by building microscopes. What happens if we build a macroscope? A macroscope is one that allows you to take in lots of material and come up with new ideas by seeing it all at once. And that, I think, is some of the opportunity of our time, an opportunity for universities to play a role with these uh, materials at that sort of scale. So archiving of moving images, it's just not that expensive. Sometimes, though, you get uh, some attention that you're not looking for. Um, so there are these nasty grams called uh, national security letters um, that are the creature of the Patriot Act where 
um, almost anybody in the government can go in demand of enterprises and libraries information about um, their business records, that they can go and demand it. And you can't even say that you ever received the request. So we got one of these nasty crabs asking for information about patients at the Internet Archive um, from the FBI. And uh, we talked to our lawyers and said, so how can we, uh, can we get a court order? Can we even push back? They said, no. Um, what, if we, um, uh, what if we don't comply? In jail? Uh, is there anything we can do? They said, yeah, the only thing you can do is sue the United States government. So we sued the United States government. <laughs> and we won! Um, so, <laughs> so before I bring this up is, yes, it's a good thing, and yes, you should remember that we did this, and you can do this too if you ever get one of these nasty groups, but is by going and being a library really helps. Um, that people understand um, the idea of reader privacy. If you really blow reader privacy, bad things can happen. That people can get rounded up for the books that they've read um, and targeted for those uh, behaviors. Even software is able to be uh, digitized and made available. So what I'm trying to do is argue that now all of these older materials are technically possible to preserve and to be made possible to give back if you do it in a way that's respectful to those that are still trying to make money. I'd say the next frontier in this area, the one that I'm concerned about, is we're trusting these companies with our memories ourselves. Personal digital archives are now splintered all over, all over the net so that uh, we're, our, our, our lives, our digital lives, they're not in shoeboxes underneath um, they're not in the file boxes that are that stacked up in our basements. They're not even on the hard drives we can't read anymore. They're on these cloud services, which, you know, are those going to be around? Well, they don't have a long track record of being around, um, so I, I would kind of worry about it. So I'd say in this um, uh, right to remember, I'd say, please remember. Like, we all have a personal responsibility to go and take responsibility for what's precious to us and make recordings of them and bring them back from these services. And I'm not sure exactly how that's all going to happen, and it's not happening terribly well at the moment. So bringing these things um, online and making them accessible is doable. I'm going to hit just uh, a little bit more on sort of the preservation area in terms of how do we go and preserve not only the digital, but the physical. If we're trying to build the Library of Alexandria version 2, what is the Library of Alexandria version 1 probably best known for? Burning! It's right? <laughs> best known for not being here anymore. Right? And that's, sort of, that's all there is uh, 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 left, is about eight pieces of papyrus that are thought to have been in the, the ancient library, which is the center of learning of the ancient world. Um, so if we want to, uh, so, if we're going to build an uh, version two, let's get some things right. And so we thought, why don't we make multiple copies? And we, then they started the, uh, the new library of Alexander. We said, uh, would you take a copy from us? So that there'd be starting to build an international library system. Wouldn't that be cool? So there'd be an international library system that have large scale swap agreements to go and keep things going. So that if walls went up and down, or a war, or a regime change that made things uh, uh, collapse in a particular area, that after that was cured, the others would be able to help rebuild. And so we're, we're trying this in, in small form with the Library of Alexandria and uh, in Amsterdam um, in, in the Netherlands. So between the, um, San Francisco, earthquake zone, uh, the Middle East, and a flood zone, um, <laughs> what could go wrong? Um, so anyway, I don't think we're out of the woods yet um, in, in this area. Um, but in terms of just showing what the rapid increase of what uh, we've been able to store, this is 2008 and about two petabytes. Um, this is what the Wayback Machine looked like. Um, it's actually the shipping container that sat outside as a computer. So I could, so I could answer the question of how big is what we have that? How big is what? How big is the web? It's eight feet by eight feet by 20 feet. <laughs> so that's how big the web uh, uh, was at that time. And uh, now we've got about 25 petabytes uh, of data um, that's stored that is our cultural heritage. Um, and it's used by millions of people every day. 
And we found that um, we couldn't just get away with just being bit oriented. We had to do physically oriented things because libraries are throwing things out. <laughs> so now we don't want just one copy of every book ever published digitally. We want one physically. And so we um, are trying to build very dense, inexpensive systems to go and store these materials. And this is uh, what it looks like in Richmond, California, where our shelves, if you will, are these shipping containers that are inside warehouses. So it's books in boxes in shipping containers in a warehouse surrounded by a couple levels of nonprofits. And so that's sort of our protection system to try to go and make it so that these, even the physical materials, can live and go forward. So this is all sort of the exercise of sort of memory in the digital um, age. And what's been uh, fun about this journey is just the number of people and interesting projects that you get to overlap with when, you're, when you've got some, something you can offer within the cultural uh, sphere. I would say that universal access to all knowledge um, is within our grasp. And it could be one of the great things that humans have ever done. I think it's the opportunity of our generation that through this openness era, this uh, we're living in a time where universal education is thought of as a good, that we can uh, build something that might be remembered, like the Library of Alexandria or the Man on the Moon project. And to close, uh, again, carved above the door, of the Carnegie's Library in, in Pittsburgh um, is free to the people. Thank you very much. So 
Uh, the web collection, yes, we have bots that run around, but there are 400 institutions that have created uh, these, these subject collections, and those are well done. We also um, uh, enable and empower other libraries. So those scanners, those are in 33 libraries, but they serve about 500 libraries that bring things to those and, and make them available. There's, so there are specialties that people try to make sure. I went and um, digitized my grandfather's books because I only had one copy and I had two kids. Um, and I wanted to make sure that it was still around. Um, so I'd say that it's that. And that so it's, but that's not great because you think, well, there are some things that, are, that don't have some advocacy people bringing things forward. So they're naturally being excluded. Um, so we're going to try to spread it as far as we can, and we don't want to be the only one. You know, the, the idea of, it, when there's one, that's kind of the wrong answer, except in Buddhism. Right? <laughs> uh, and it's like, you know, the idea is, let's have lots of these things. Um, and that um, is, is our approach so far. Uh, um, I'm Michael Brown, uh, I remember about 15 or 15. Yes. It was actually in Pittsburgh, and they had gone through the archives of the uh, Carnegie Library and gotten all of these street houses, uh, house, uh, photos of people's houses, people could submit them. And all that's gone. I, I tried to go on that again. There, it doesn't exist anymore. I just wondered, I mean, they had started this, and it's no longer there. Yeah. So, do you know right. anything there, about There was this, this wonderful article on Medium that I didn't write. So don't trust a corporation to do a librarian's job. That um, the motivations are different. Um, I, my hat is off to what Google's been able to pull off. I mean, it is astonishing. We're we're this big compared to the monolith that is. Um, and but their motivations are different. Um, what costs and doesn't cost, and and um, so we we need um, a blur of different types of organizations. Um, and we need other versions of these organizations. So trying to make things as open so that they can be mass copied, so at least the base materials can be reinterpreted, is not necessarily how things really work right now. Um, and some of it is because people feel afraid. Even if those Google engineers would have said it would have been great to go when they turned that off, there's probably some lawyer going to say, you can't donate that to somebody else. So, you know, what if, you know, blank, blank, blank. So destruction is usually what happens in these digital materials. Um, waiting for, it, it used to be that archives were built out of basically dead people's stuff. Um, and, you know, they, they died, and then they said, the, the heirs tried to figure out, oh, what do we do? Let's give it to Berkeley. Um, right, and that's where, um, that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. But in the digital realm, it's already gone. Um, the, the companies, when a company goes down, there's no digital record left. It's just, it, it evaporates. So we have to be very different how we do this, and much more proactive. So if there's a call towards action, it's be proactive. Um, and think about how it's going to be regarded by the person's stuff that it might be, um, but do it. And um, you know, to the extent that I, I'm getting honored by giving a Regents lecture is because we just did it. Um, and we did it in such a way that it's um, useful um, to people. And we all play a role. I wanted to say that um, I think that the internet archive is like a breath of fresh air. And there's a way in which I, I worked on the Emma Goldman papers, and we kept trying to put it, we kept trying to raise a microphone from the National Archives that we put together for 15 years. We tried to get it digitized. And in every single situation, it was a company that would do it, and then lock it in so that they would sell subscriptions to places like Berkeley. And so one of the things that I think is great about what you do is you don't have to be a student at an institution to be able to get access to that. And how do you deal with that? I mean, I think it's wonderful. But the well, whole system, like including here at Berkeley, 
is based on having these kinds of uh, collections. We, we've completely screwed it up. <laughs> so this digitization wave was supposed to make things much more available. Um, but you know, there are costs associated with building these collections, and the way that they tried to recover those costs is they built walls around it and sold access to often librarians. So the library system in the United States is a $12 billion a year industry. Now, three or four billion goes to publishers' products. But if you're the university librarian at, at, at Berkeley, you really only want to serve Berkeley. It's not because you don't want to serve other people. It's you just have a limited amount of money, and a lot of professors are going, I need this. Um, and so the business model has built up around publishers going and selling access that are restricted, which is dumb. I mean, it doesn't work very well. Um, but it makes sense if you're, how the motivation structures work. It doesn't work well on the internet where it should be published free and open. And there are a new generation of organizations that are trying to figure out how to stay alive, how to make money when you give everything away. Right? <laughs> And, and there are some successes. Wikipedia is one. The Internet Archive, I'd say, is another. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is one of the top law firms in the country, and they give away all of their legal time. Um, so there's uh, Mozilla. is the open source and free software uh, models. Can you make money by giving things away? And the library system is perfect for this, because we're paid to give things away. We just aren't giving ourselves away as well as we um, as we could. So I say there's we need some new models. So people's motivations are, are there for real reasons, uh, but it's ended up in a situation where things are overly locked up. So thank you very much for uh, for contributing the uh, the Evan Goldman microfilms, which we digitized, and we were we're working over the last few days to try to make it so that it's really easy to use resource that'll then just be available. Hi. Um, I work as a journalist, um, more accurately than me right now, I work as a photojournalist, so the bulk of my, what I do for a living is based on these copyrights. Yes. Um, but at the same time, I am a data moralist, much like Aaron Swartz, and I see these agencies like Getty Images that own millions of images, the canon of photojournalism from the beginning of time, locked up behind these protective yes. copyright laws. And so I'm curious, you know, this might be a piggyback from the last question, but how, how are we to make money? And what, what do you see as the future of copyright? Because what I've seen over the last couple of decades is not a loosening up of these copyright laws, but a, a more stringent approach to that. I don't, I don't have all the answers, but you've got it exactly right. Some of these problems, like how, how do we get writers to continue to work and live and, and, and grow and thrive? Um, and how do we keep publishing going? I would say there's enough money. It's just poorly distributed. That, we're, that the way that we buy things um, is not, is, is not uh, architected uh, very well. I think that there are um, areas like inside a library or inside most universities, it's almost copyright free zones. Right? They pay to get things to be there, but then you should be able to do everything within it um, freely and easily. And I love I, I, the, the tradition of academic papers is um, you have a responsibility to read all of the other papers and to build on it. Right? Not only are you <laughs> allowed to, you have to. Um, and the only real crime is not um, uh, it is not copying, it's copying without attribution. So it's plagiarizing and calling it your own. So I like actually the mottos, the your data moralist uh, 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 comment uh, within academia, that, that it, at least it should operate much more in that um, type of realm. So I, I don't have an answer for how you can get paid more uh, for, for writing good works. Um, it, it, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in the business models. Ad-based models don't work very well. If I have one regret during the Waze era is we didn't put in place a very good business model. Um, the business models, um, the AOL 
wealth had um, before, so before I had sold the company. I really liked it. It was a royalty model. They took all of the users' payments that they were doing, and they took 10 to 15 percent of it and gave it back upstream to the people that made the content that kept people online for that period of time. I like the royalty model. That's how books work, um, or used to work. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a better model in some senses than advertising. But it's uh, unsolved. Um, Last question? <laughs> a lot of pressure. Um, I have a question about this push to uh, digitize a complete literature that you were discussing with the Balinese. And perhaps this is the mathematician in me, but I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about how you determine completeness. Mm. Um, we piggyback on others. How do we determine completeness of a collection? Um, I, I, I think there's whole philosophical departments in this, but it's sort of a practical purpose. Um, so in the case of Balinese, there's two major libraries on Bali. Um, and we asked, you know, if we do one of them, did we do it? <laughs> and they said, yeah, 90, 95% here, you're pretty much uh, there. Um, and I'd say the combination of sort of declaring it to be complete and then having people be offended by it and saying, hey, it's not complete, it needs these things too, and we say, please do, um, that that is maybe the way to fill the, the, the gaps by making it a bit of a group project to go and say, if you contribute to this, our, our goal is to be complete, let's get it there. Um, and so that, I guess it's not a big mathematical, but it's a very people-oriented and practical method of going about it. The biggest thing that I think that the Balinese did is they declared it their goal to make this happen. Um, and then the, lots of people could find mechanisms of, of, of participating. So I would love it if Berkeley were to say, let's go and take our libraries um, and make them digital. Right? Let's just bring them digital. And the answer is, well, when are we done? It's like, you're never quite done. Um, but if we do declare, let's go and get a digital campus here. Um, then all sorts of new type of research would be able to, to happen. So I guess it's mostly, uh, Maybe it's a little bit of that, declare it to be so, and then allow it to happen within that, uh, within that tent. So thank you very, very much for, for coming.